and we should now be live on Facebook. Let's just get everything populated over here so we have a, a good view and we'll get ourselves started. Actually, the probably closest to on time start that we've had in the 12 or 13 episodes of the tour. So that's a really, really good thing. <laughs> okay, so I'm gonna use my cell phone over here and I'm gonna mute my cell phone because, and I'm gonna mute my office phone because I don't wanna bother anybody. Um, okay, so let's see everybody, we're getting started here. Participants are coming in, there we go, all right. So in just a moment, we're going to begin our presentation. I just wanted to give some housekeeping notes before I turn it over to our co-host for the evening, Dr. Williams. Um, this is, I think, our 13th uh, Big Hearted Warrior virtual tour. We're sorry we can't see you in person, but COVID took care of that for us a year ago. So tonight, what we're going to be doing is we are streaming through Facebook. So if you're watching us on Facebook, we are not taking Q&A from the Facebook feed. You will need to use the Zoom link, come into the room, and you can ask your questions in the room. For those of you asking questions in the room, there will be a Q&A uh, feature at the bottom of your Zoom browser. You can populate that at any time. I will be popping up a poll in just a few moments. And okay, we have a hand raise already. I, I will have to deal with that in a moment. Um, so what we're going to be doing is we're going to take, take Q&A from the room only in the, in the box at the end of the night, we will turn off recording. We will stop streaming on Facebook. If anybody has a question that they do not want saved in digital form and on the internet, et cetera, they can wait until after the Q&A session and, and, and we turn off the uh, streaming so that you can be ensured that your question isn't going to live forever on the internet. This will be reposted on YouTube and the HCMA website. So it's not going to be exactly private uh, once you ask a question. So if you wanna ask a question in writing, we will not identify you. If you want to wait till the end, we can address your questions with hand raising at that point. So I am going to stop my share right now and I am going to do two introductions. First to my staff, Amy Mann and Julie Russo are with us this evening. Um, Amy is our meeting coordinator and Julie is our volunteer coordinator. And we thank them both for their help in putting these really great programs together and making sure that you're communicated with as best as possible, getting you into the program, both our faculty and our participants. And now I'm going to hand it over to, Do okay, so Robbie, your name looks really long and very fancy when you put it out there, Byron Robinson Williams III. I kind of know you as Robbie. So uh, Dr. Williams, will you please introduce us to your team and tell us what tonight has for us? Yeah, you, yeah, I, I go by Robbie. I, I do have a big, long, multi-syllabic name, um, but I, I go by Robbie Williams. And, and thank you, Lisa, for the introduction. It's a pleasure to be here tonight. Um, yeah, and, and, and greetings from Atlanta to everyone out there tuning in. Um, we're glad to have everyone here tonight. I'm gonna share my screen. I'm hoping to get to the point someday where I can share my screen without saying share my screen, but I haven't haven't gotten there yet. I think we all need to make that announcement. Yeah, it just, it just makes you feel better, I guess. Okay, there's our contact information. So again, my name is Robbie Williams. I am the medical director of the Adult Hypertrophic Cardiomyopathy Clinic at Emory University in Atlanta, Georgia. I've uh, been in this role for a little over 10 years now, since about 2008. Um, and we are excited to do this this evening. We have some wonderful members of our team. We have a big team, so only a, a small portion of our team was able to, to join us tonight. Um, uh, from, I think first up will be Dr. Oslam Billen. Uh, Dr. Billen joined our team about a year and a half ago after completing her fellowship here at Emory. Um, she is like myself, she is a non-invasive general cardiologist that uh, specializes in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and she is a fantastic doctor and person, and she is going to be giving a, a update on the recent guidelines that just came out and talking about some uh, new pharmacologic therapy that's coming soon. 
I uh, believe next up is Linda Knight. Linda is a certified genetic counselor at Children's Healthcare or Sibley Heart Center, which is part of Children's Healthcare of Atlanta. Um, I'm glad she's able to be here tonight to represent our uh, pediatric colleagues that we work closely with. And uh, she is a, a fantastic genetic coordinator, her and her colleague, Aaron Demo, I've known for several years and they've been uh, tremendously helpful through the years in helping me interpret genetic testing, help me get testing for our patients and figure out how to pay for testing, et cetera. So I've learned a lot and she's been a, a fantastic uh, help to us through the years. So I'm glad she's able to be here tonight. Uh, and then uh, Dr. Jonathan Kim. Uh, Jonathan is the director of sports cardiology at Emory and he is the team cardiologist for Emory University and Georgia Tech and the Atlanta Falcons and the Atlanta Braves and the Atlanta Hawks and many, many others. And he uh, works with us as well. And he's gonna, he's a, an expert in exercise and heart disease. And so he's gonna talk to us about exercise this evening. And then I'm gonna talk after Dr. Kim talks. And you can see our contact information on the screen. Uh, up top is sort of the adult side of things. We see patients both at Emory University Hospital and at Emory St. Joseph's Hospital. And there are the addresses and contact numbers at those two sites. Uh, I, I go to both sites, Dr. Billen, uh, is mainly just at Emory University Hospital. Uh, and then you see the contact information for uh, the, the pediatric side at, at Sibley Heart Center. Uh, they're just up the street from us and they have a, a fancy new building, which you'll see in the background of Linda's talk um, a little bit later. So, so there's our contact information. Again, we're uh, really uh, excited and grateful to be here tonight and looking forward to talking about hypertrophic cardiomyopathy this evening. So thanks again, Lisa. You're on mute. <laughs> Lisa, you, I think you're muted. I'm muted. I try to keep myself on mute. So when I move, I don't make noise. I was gonna say, I was gonna tell everybody that I was gonna share my screen, but I could have done it and you didn't know. Okay, so I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about the whole tour. We have a couple more stops on this tour this year, May 13th, May 22nd, June 10th, September 9th, and October 16th. We are, that is gonna be a special event that's gonna be, we are programming the evening of Saturday at the summit. So there's gonna be three hours of HCM content uh, stay tuned for the agenda for that one. It's going to be a little different than the rest of these tours. And we're going to talk about some other upcoming events. I want to take a moment to acknowledge our sponsors for this Big Hearted Warrior Tour. Uh, Bristol Myers Squibb, formerly Myocardia, but still Myocardia's name is in there. Cytokinetics and Vitae and Boston Scientific. We thank them all for their support, without which we wouldn't be able to put programs like this together for you. So tonight we've already kind of gotten the rundown of what we're gonna hear about. I'm gonna to try to be really cognizant of time because Dr. Kim has to be out of here for another meeting at eight and I want you to get your questions into him. Okay, and that's just the secondary tour. So what I thought I would do a little different tonight is just kind of highlight what it is that we're going to be featuring, oops, why is it, I am sad, not going, there it is. What we're going to be featuring tonight in the HCM pathway of disease progression and disease experience, excuse me. So in the asymptomatic low risk or gene positive group, I've just put a little asterisk up there because it's the only place I say genes on this thing. So we're gonna talk a little bit about genetics tonight. We're also gonna talk about ICD therapy and knowing who's at high risk for cardiac arrest. The guidelines update will kind of touch on most of the topics in here because there's a little bit from every little area of HCM. But I want you to just take a moment to remember that as you're listening to all this data being presented, you are not every patient we're talking about. You're probably a subset of a subset and you're gonna to have to look at your own HCM care and listen to the talks tonight. And it may not all connect with you personally, it may be somebody in your family, but please do use the Q&A feature to ask clarifying questions throughout the evening. Our faculty can answer them as we go, 
or we can pause between talks and try to answer some questions. We will try to save Q&A for the end of the night in general, but if there's something you need clarification on, please let us know. So I wanted to spend just a couple minutes talking about the HCMA Recognized Center of Excellence program. Uh, Robbie, I think we started your program. You're kind of like between legacy and new school. So it's like 10 years ago that we probably started this process. And it's evolved a lot over the years. And in fact, uh, it just continues to evolve. As of March 2021, we have 42 HCMA recognized centers of excellence. We will be launching our newest program, who probably has the wrong colored dot on here today, um, on, uh, in a couple of weeks. I think the end of March, we're launching uh, Rochester General in Rochester, New York. Uh, we have 16 inquiries in house for potential new programs. All of their dots are not properly represented on the screen either. I have to catch this one up a little bit. Suffice to say, they're growing. The new guidelines document led credibility to the concept and in fact validated the concept in language we'll talk about in a minute. So as of right now, we believe we have about 45,000 individuals in the care of these HCM centers. That number we're gonna to try to nail down really good by the end of the year, but that's what we have going on out there. So what is an HCM center of excellence? Now I could have put Aslam's picture up here with yours as you're both kind of the director positions and monitoring these patients from the top and HCM is serious enough. So yeah, I use stick figures once in a while to lighten things up. So our hokemologist, in this case, we have Dr. Williams showing, is going to be the gatekeeper in a sense of all things HCM so we don't get lost in the system. So if these are our patients that with HCM, they each go down their own pathway and they may land in different buckets for different periods of time. And some may just kind of stay up here. Now, if you go down to genetics, genetics isn't gonna manage you forever. She's gonna send you right on back to your hokemologist. EP is gonna send you back up as well. Mental health services is gonna work in concert. Interventional cardiology is gonna send you back up. You only meet the surgeon once and then we're kind of done with that. And then we have you all return back to your hokemologist for nice comprehensive care so nothing falls through the cracks. HCM is complicated and there's a lot of moving parts and you need somebody to coordinate all of that for you. So as I mentioned earlier, the new guidelines, which we'll be talking about in just a few moments, is really validating this concept that was just a thought back in 1996 and now has evolved into these 42 centers. Not every center is, is equal. Not every center does surgery. Not every center does transplant. Not every center does pediatrics. But the, the rest of our centers all pretty much do soup to nuts, except for those key items, and they have referral re arrangements for those. But remember, there's still a role for the, PD the primary cardiologist in your HCM care, especially if you're a travel into a center of excellence. You need somebody in your local community that can coordinate care in emergencies or in urgent situations with your HCMA or HCM team. So I just wanted to bring that to your attention that this is not an all-inclusive, but you can look at the guidelines document available at 4hcm.org for more. This is the language that they actually brought out explaining what a high volume, a comprehensive and a primary program would look like. Um, again, just validating what we do. But also in the guidelines, there's this concept of shared decision-making. That is actually a science. Shared decision-making is a science within the medical profession, but it's a little confusing to a patient that's, oh, I'm gonna share in the decision-making. But how does the patient know all of the variables? How does a patient make a truly informed shared decision? So that's where a center of excellence teamed up with the HCMA and the services that we provide to help educate patients and make sure that they understand this is where the partnership is just magic because if somebody tells you you need this procedure or that procedure and you just say yes, are they right? Is it a center of excellence? Do they have expert knowledge in HCM? So how can you do shared decision-making with a hometown cardiologist? You probably can't because they don't know enough and you don't know what they don't know. So that's why the center of excellence makes all the difference in care. Um, oops, I cut out an extra slide. There's lots of proof in the pudding for center of excellence models. We know outcomes are better, complications are less, mental health is better, and overall quality of life for the patients are better. So how do we get you 
involved in the community, supported and educated between doctor's appointments. Social media. I know not everybody loves Facebook, but it's worked for this community. And maybe there'll be some additional sources of, of uh, outreach ability and communication in the coming months and years. But for right now, we have our official page. We have a general discussion group where nobody outside of the group can read it. It's not exactly an intimate group anymore. It's about 7,000 people. So it's not gonna show up on your personal Facebook feed that you posted into the private group, but it's not exactly private, private. It's just private amongst your big hearted friends. We also have a parents network that we're starting up. And in addition, <clears throat> we have a group called HCMAI, which is an international outreach. And we're currently working with Sweden and Italy to develop um, pages in their language. We've translated our poster and we're translating other information. I just remember what I forgot to put in here um, that I have to remember to tell you later. So I had to make myself a note. So we now have our online support group meetings. You can sign up for them anytime on our website, 4hcm.org. You'll, you'll see our events directory and you'll see online support groups. We have them several times a week. There are up to about 25 different opportunities per month for you to participate. I'm running a few groups myself. I'm gonna be adding one. Julie, remember to talk to me about that tomorrow. Um, but we definitely need a pre-transplant pathway group because four calls yesterday were on that topic. So it, it's a need. So we have these trained moderators and support group leaders who've worked with the HCMA and are part of the community, that you're big hearted brethren, and they're going to help run discussion groups. We will eventually be inviting in uh, members of the medical community to give little talks to the groups and start marking them out that way. So uh, that's the support groups. We have Tales from the Heart, which I'm doing tomorrow with Dr. Marty Marin. And the topic tomorrow ties in a little bit with tonight. We're gonna stay on the exercise uh, topic and discuss the new guidelines in depth as they relate to exercise. And we're going to feature a member of the community, Seth, who was an athlete who made some decisions, ended up having a cardiac arrest many years later, but was saved by his ICD. So it's a really interesting story of shared decision-making. So I encourage you to join us tomorrow to hear his story. It's really enlightening. Um, so that's part of our Share Your Story program. Seth said, I wanted to share my story. We put them on Tales from the Heart and we're gonna create content around that and help educate people about HCM and exercise. It's not as scary as it sounds. It's actually a very positive story. So I'd encourage you to join us for that. I wanna take a moment to recognize some changes here at the HCMA effective like this week and some are coming up sooner or later than that. <clears throat> we have some new staff. Our new intake coordinator is Sabrina Cuddy. It's really helpful to have a big hearted uh, friend out there who happens to have an MPH and um, a master of public health with a focus in communication who wants to come to work for the HCMA. So uh, Sabrina will be working as an intake coordinator. So those of you who call in might be speaking to Sabrina or Julie. Uh, in two weeks, uh, we have our first two full-time employees. Everybody else at the HCMA has been part-time all these years. Um, I'm getting a new assistant director a new project manager, and part of their duties and responsibilities are going to be to help us build a new committee structure where we will be reaching out to the community, and Julie, the volunteer coordinator, will be talking to you about your opportunities to volunteer on our diversity committee, our patient education, our finance committee is expanding, our center of excellence review committee, and our medical affairs committee, as well as a few others that we're still working on their charters. So stay tuned for updates on that. It's going to be a lot of fun and we're going to get a lot of really important work done. Um, we have our legislative subcommittee that was the first committee that we formed in this way with a volunteer team. Um, it's working so well we're branching it out into others. So stay tuned for updates from the legislative committee. What we're going to be focusing on first and foremost is inclusion of the PPE, so when a child does a sports physical, they're asked a certain number of questions about cardiac condition. For whatever reason, we don't ask those in a well child examination, and we are going to start doing so. We do it in the state of New Jersey. It doesn't take a lot of time or money. It's just about asking mom and dad the right questions about their family health history and the child's symptoms, which will hopefully help lead us to more timely diagnosis and treatment for those out there. We will be working on other initiatives as well. Okay, I'm wrapping up here and I'm trying to talk really fast to keep on target for tonight. 
I want you to know that we're having a fun event that won't have anything to do with cardiac and the food isn't really even heart healthy. So I'm just putting that disclaimer out there right now. Uh, a good friend of mine, his name is Guy Mitchell. He happens to be a chef at a little place called the White House. And he's worked there for five administrations. This might be his sixth administration now that I'm thinking about it. Um, and he has great behind the scenes stories about what people eat at state dinners and who has funny stories associated with them. There's one I'm not going to I'm not going to tell the tale, but it's a very interesting story about Vladimir Putin and Barbara Bush. There's boxer shorts involved in the story. You're going to have to join us to hear the rest of the story. It's kind of interesting. Um, but you might have a chance, even if you don't want to spend the money for the entry fee, there's going to be in two slides a picture. And we have one entry to give away. So Julie, make note of the first person who puts the right name at the end, because they're going to get an email link so that they get free entry to the, the Let's Get Sauced event. So um, it'll be a lot of fun. You'll get a shopping list if you want to cook along. If you're a foodie, you can cook along with us. Otherwise, you can cook with, you know, just watch <laughs> Guy and I cook together and tell some fun stories. Okay, so one more slide and then it's the game. So everybody Get ready at your keyboards. I'm going to thank everybody. Oh, I'm sorry. There's a typo on here. I want to thank my friends at Emory, not OSHU. They were the last one. Forgot to fix that here. Um, for their participation tonight and our partnership over the years. To our board, we have some new board members on board this past month as well. Uh, I will encourage you to look at our last newsletter for that information. To all of our volunteers. And of course, to Brandy, my heart donor, without whom I would not be here today to talk to you. Another little programming note. If you have not become a member of the HCMA or have not renewed your membership, if you want to do so now, we have a number of 23andMe Ancestry and Health kits. It has nothing to do with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. We were given free kits to give away to members. So you have to have a membership to get one. So if you want a free 23andMe kit, you can become a member of the HCMA and it's a value added. Now, are you ready for the picture of the very important person in the history of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy? This is a challenging one. So on your mark, get set, go. Do, 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 do. Using the chat feature, somebody put the name of who this person is. I'm trying to get my chat feature so I can actually see it. Chat. We don't have anybody yet. Okay, I'm gonna start giving hints. He actually, was an HCM patient himself. Nope, it's not Dr. Lever. Dr. Lever would never be caught dead with a cigarette in his hand. It is not Dr. Marin. Time for the next hint. This individual um, is very was very good friends with a person named Dr. Eugene Brunwald. Nope. Wow, okay. This man created the myectomy, which under another name actually is named after him. Wow. Come on, people, I want to give away this. You got to know your HCM history. Come on, you got Dr. Google right next to you. Who created the myectomy? Nobody. I don't know if I can give you the answer then. Three, two, close, 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 close. Who said, okay, who's, who said more? That's close, but it's not it. I'm gonna give this 10 more seconds. No, this is Dr. Nope. <laughs> These are fun to watch though. Come on guys, I wanna give this away. No, it's not Dr. Marin. <laughs> oh, wow. I might come up with another. Yes, Cindy wins. Cindy wins. This is Dr. Andrew Glenn Morrow, the creator of the myectomy 
He was diagnosed with HCM by Dr. Eugene Brunwald, who actually made the first diagnosis in HCM in, 19, in 1959. Um, and Dr. Morrow actually had HCM and he created the surgery for HCM. So you've learned a little piece that will not get you very far outside of the HCMA in a trivia contest, but it does have value here. Um, I'm gonna have to come up with another picture next time. So I thank you for your attention to my talk and I am going to hand this off for a talk on the guidelines with Aslam Billen, who can share her slides without telling us she's doing it because she's brilliant. And I am, oh, before we start there, I just wanna go over our poll. I'm gonna end the poll. And I'm gonna say that most of you are, I'm gonna share the results real quick. You're mostly from the Southeast, surprise, surprise, but we even got some Canadians and West Coasters in here with us. Most of you are patients or patients of fam and family members or family member of somebody with HCM. Uh, we've got one medical provider here tonight. We have a number of people who are diagnosed in the last two years. Uh, we have some, most of you are meds, some with ICDs, some have experienced AFib, some of us have lost family members. Lots of you have had genetic testing. I'm not surprised out of an Emory crew and somebody's considering septal reduction therapy. So that gives us a little bit of a peek as who's with us today. Asla, I hand it off to you and I thank you. Thank you, Lisa, and thank you, Robbie, as well. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for having me today and thanks for being here today. So I will take the next 15 minutes or so to give you a brief update on the recently published guidelines. Okay, for some reason, this is not moving. Okay, Lisa, I'm gonna go ahead and reshare my screen, hold on. Take your time, technology has that way about it. And, and John Kim, uh, Matt Martinez says hi. Okay, there you go. So. Um, first of all, what is the current status of HCM in 2021? So back in the date, back in 1970s, when the disease was initially described, it was defined as a rare disease with dismal outcome. The annual mortality was reported to be as high as 6%. This is because at the time we did not have effective therapies against HCM. Also, the data was skewed as it mostly came from tertiary referral centers with a lot of sick patients. Nowadays, in the recently published literature, we know that the annual mortality rate is as low as less than 1%, and that is comparable to general U.S. population. This is because now that we have effective therapies for HCM, importantly defibrillators, and we also have a better understanding of the true prevalence of the disease. And so nowadays, we're describing this disease as a common contemporary treatable disease that can be compatible with normal longevity. Although the sudden cardiac death risk significantly decreased over the past couple of years, there is still an unmet need of prevalent heart failure. That is because the currently available therapies target the symptoms mainly, but they don't alter the progression of the disease necessarily. So this is a nice historical timeline of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Um, it was first described back in 1950s, and Dr. Goodwin reported the first surgical case in, back in 1960. Um, we have been using beta blockers since 1960s, and first ICD was implanted back in 1980, and we have some recent literature um, that has looked into some new medications that came up in the pipeline as well. And the most recent guidelines were published back in November 2020, and they were spearheaded by Dr. Steve Oman from Mayo Clinic. So this was a big document. Uh, there was about 85 pages. So what I will try to do is to take you through uh, 10 most important take-home messages from this document. And as Lisa mentioned previously, I think one of the most important uh, statements from the document was the importance of shared decision-making. It is very important that we provide full disclosure of all testing and treatment modalities and the risks and benefits and outcomes of those treatment modalities to our patients and let them be engaged and express their own goals and concerns and preferences so that we can come up with a shared decision. Um, it is important that we apply this to 
both genetic testing, evaluation of individuals having cardiac death risk, whether or not that person needs an ICD, whether or not they should be participating in high intensity exercise and competitive sports as well. Also um, medical and invasive therapies. This might take time and it might take more than one visit. The way that I do this typically is that I give them the information and I tell them that they don't have to make a decision that same visit. And I you know, tell them to go home, speak with their families and their significant others. And I typically follow up with them during a, either a phone call or a video conference so that we can come up with the best informed decision. And the other very important statement from this document was, uh, as Lisa mentioned, the importance of team-based approach and comprehensive hypertrophic cardiomyopathy centers. I think this is the first guideline document that actually talks about the importance of comprehensive HCM centers. So the local cardiologist is important as they will initiate testing and they will provide surveillance to our patients and they will give them the initial treatment recommendations and they will also be able to rapidly assess for a change in disease status. But we know that um, especially when the patients need more advanced procedures, then they should be referred to um, a comprehensive HCM center. This is because we have more and more literature showing that the outcomes vary significantly based on hospital procedural volumes. So the outcomes are gonna be much better in these comprehensive HCM centers. It is very important that these patients get hooked up with these centers. Another very important statement from this document was the importance of family screening. This might be, many, many families might be under screened, unfortunately. And it's very important that we have to counsel every patient and their families for the potential genetic transmission of HCM. Um, as we know that it is a genetic disorder, it's autosomal dominant, and there's about 50% chance of giving that to the offspring as well. Another very important statement was management of atrial fibrillation. We know that atrial fibrillation is a very prevalent problem in patients with HCM, and we have more and more evidence suggesting that the risk of stroke is adequately increased in these patients, so that they should be by default on anticoagulation blood thinners with either direct neuro-oral anticoagulants or by warfarin. And there also has been a nice section um, regarding sports and exercise. Um, back in the day, I think the guidelines were a bit more dogmatic. You know, we used to tell our patients to do this and not to do this, but I think the most recent guidelines have been more lenient. This is because we have more and more data accumulating that has shown that probably is safer than what was previously reported. Um, and so it is important that we, we provide the currently available literature, but also again, come up with an individualized shared decision-making with the patient. Dr. Kim is gonna go through this in more detail in a second. Another important statement from this was treatment of heart failure. Again, these patients might typically get undertreated for heart failure symptoms, um, but especially when they don't have left ventricular alpha tract obstruction, when they don't have those significant gradients, we should be able to treat them similarly to other patients with heart failure symptoms. Um, there was a lot of emphasis on importance of cardiac imaging, especially MRI. We know that echocardiography continues to be foundational for patients with HCM, especially with initial diagnosis and follow-up of the complications as well. But cardiac MRI is probably underutilized. It is a fantastic imaging modality that gives us tissue characterization. It is important to utilize cardiac MRI, especially when there is diagnostic uncertainty, when the echo pictures are poor, limited patient windows. Also, when there is a need for more information regarding sudden cardiac death risk assessment in patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. In my opinion, I think if a patient does not have a contraindication to a cardiac MRI, they should get a cardiac MRI. And there was also a lot of emphasis on invasive therapies, namely septal myomectomy and alcohol septal ablation. We have more and more accumulating evidence that has shown that when these procedures are performed at experienced centers, they're quite safe and very effective as well. So again, when they're performed by experienced physicians, we can actually offer them to, uh, to patients during at an early course of their disease as well, without letting them suffer um, many years on medications. 
And another important statement was sudden cardiac death risk assessment. We know that this is a moving target as we have newly emerging markers in assessment of sudden cardiac death risk. It is very important to recognize this, that this is a moving target. And also, you know, give the patients a detailed information about their individual risk markers. But it is, it is also very important to give them the magnitude of their individualized risk using the currently available risk calculators. I think giving the patients a number does help them tremendously, but it also help, helps us understand the patient's individual perception of their disease and their risk. You know, 5% annual risk may not be so important for a patient, but it may be unaffordable for another patient. So it is important for us to understand their own perception and goals in their lives as well. Sudden cardiac death risk assessment in children is a very specific subject as well as individual risk factors in pediatric patient population carry a very different weight than they do in adult patient population because these are going to be little tiny adults and they're going to have growing bodies and different body sizes and different ages as well. And placing an ICD in a young growing individual is going to be a little risky because it's going to come up with more device complications. So putting in a device in a young pediatric patient is going to have a different threshold than it is going to have in an adult patient. So it is very important that pediatric patients, children get seen at centers with experience with the pediatric patient population. Just a quick summary on the medical management of patients with symptomatic hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So when patients have obstructive physiology, that is by definition presence of an LVOT gradient above 30 millimeter mercury by exercise or at rest, that is something that we can measure with echocardiography. We typically start with beta blockers and if that fails and we try calcium channel blockers and we typically use diazepiramide as a second line agent. And if the patients are direct refractory, then we offer them septal reduction therapies. When patients have non-obstructive physiology, they don't have that gradient, the pressure gradient as a therapeutic target. So we have less options with these patients. So again, we typically start treatment with beta blockers and try calcium channel blockers as a second line agent as well. And if the patients are volume overloaded, then we can give them diuretics. We try to avoid diuretics when you have obstructive physiology. And if they have apical hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, apical thin thickening of the heart, then we can offer them apical myomectomy. And if they have still persistent symptoms, then their only option might be a cardiac transplant. So just two quick slides on this new medication, Mavacamten. I'm sure many of our patients have heard about this new medication, it came up in the recent literature, um, has not made it to an FDA approval yet, and it hasn't made it to the guidelines yet either. So um, let's just go back to the basics really quick here. So this is a normal heart, and this is a patient's heart with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, very thick. And here is what it looks like under microscope. This is a cardiac cell under microscope. This is a normal cardiac cell. And as you can see here, we have these little tiny proteins called actin and myosin. And when they interact with each other, they create cardiac muscle contractility. In patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, we have a lot of these interacting with each other, and that causes excessive contractility, and that over long term causes thickening of the heart muscle and eventually building up a pressure within the heart muscle causing symptoms. So Mevacam 10 is designed to inhibit this process. It is an inhibitor of this myosin protein, and it actually reverses this excessive hypercontractility to, um, to eventually improve patient symptoms and their outcomes as well. So just a quick summary of the recent literature regarding Mevacam 10. These were all recently published clinical trials. Um, we had mostly involvement of patients with mild to moderate symptoms in these clinical trials. They have looked into patients with both obstructive physiology and non-obstructive physiology. So the, the results were quite promising and favorable. Basically it has shown that Mevacamton is quite safe and effective when we use it in patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. There's some imaging data that shows that we actually do see favorable changes within the heart muscle of these patients as well. Now we're looking forward to have long-term follow-up data. Also we're looking forward to have this other Valor HCM trial, which will include sicker patients 
who are actually eligible for septal reduction therapies, myomectomy and alcohol septal ablation, to see if um, mevacamten would delay the need or decrease the need of, of these procedures. It currently is not FDA approved. It has been assigned a breakthrough status that will expedite the reprocess. I am quite optimistic that we will probably have this medication available in the next couple of months. With that, I'll thank you and I'll have any questions that you might have. Okay, thank you for that very, excuse me, that very comprehensive view of the overview of the guidelines. I love, I love the way you did that. I'm gonna just take a quick look down at the questions here. Um, uh, no, I, that didn't count, Barbara. Uh, background, disapiramide used for the treatment of HCM to reduce gradients. Few studies is known as not to be pro-rhythmic. My question is, okay, um, Andrews, I don't know what the question is because it stops at my question is. Oh, there it is. Oh boy, that's a long one. Uh, is there a case study of patients with HCM entered into ventricular tachycardia? I'm going to hold that one till the end because that's kind of off of the, the talk and I want to stay on target tonight. And those we will try to get to that. And if any of the faculty wants to take a look at the question uh, and answer, we can do that as well. It wasn't really discussed. Um, so we are going to pivot now off to the world of genetics. And Linda Knight is going to talk to us about genetic testing in HCM. And I'm going to ask Linda to please share her screen and unmute her mic and enlighten us on all things genetics. You're still on mute. And we're still still on mute. It happens. There, there we you go. Are. Okay. We are good to go. Um, you can share your screen and we can talk all things genetics. I'm working on sharing my screen. So while you're doing that, um, Barbara's asking, should somebody wait for Mavicampton instead of getting a myectomy? I am going to, from my point of view, give a no to that. We do not know when Mavicampton may be available. We are cautiously optimistic that it will make it through FDA review. That is not a guarantee. And we want to make sure that we are giving people something that's going to work and that is going to be affordable as well. You will be hearing a lot more from me on that topic mm -hmm. very, very, very soon. So stay tuned to the HCMA. We're engaging in some uh, efforts to help ensure the cost effectiveness of this new agent that may or may not make it to market. So do stay in touch with the HCMA. We got a lot of stuff going on the next couple of months. Okay, Linda, we are you successfully sh sh sharing your screen and you are successfully unmuted. Yes. I hand it off to you, my friend. Okay, thank you for your patience. I'm Linda Knight, I'm a genetic counselor and I work for Sibley Heart Center, which is affiliated with uh, Children's Hospital Atlanta. Uh, our physicians are Emory Pediatric Cardiologists and I work specifically for the Inherited Arrhythmia and uh, Cardiomyopathy Clinic, taking care of um, pediatric patients with HCM pediatric patients at risk for HCM due to family history and coordinating testing for those families. So as you know, uh, HCM is a common condition occurring in about one in 500 individuals and it runs in families. Um, the risk is about 50-50 for HCM to be uh, transmitted uh, from parent to child. And uh, this prevalent condition is probably one of the most common um, hereditary conditions globally. It doesn't segregate to any ethnic group or geographic location. And uh, genetic testing, as uh, the prior speaker mentioned, is uh, considered a cornerstone of care for HCM patients and their families. It's very important to um, family screening and increasingly important to the patient's treatment in the past um, genetic testing wasn't really thought to greatly impact a patient's care with a patient with HCM, uh, but increasingly there's gene, genotype targeted and gene targeted uh, therapies. 
So we did, we were part of a multi-center observational study a couple of years ago, looking at uptake of genetic testing in HCM families. And we found that the uptake was lower than some of our other inherited uh, heart diseases. And we looked to two surveys that were published from HCMA members. Um, th these were a little bit older in 2014 and 2015, but I don't, I'm not sure it's changed a lot based on my uh, current observations in our clinics. Um, but this survey showed that it was about 50-50 split between HCM patients in your group that responded to the survey between whether they had genetic testing or not. And the main difference between yes or no was whether or not their cardiologist had recommended doing it. And also those that did proceed with testing also had encouragement from their family to go ahead with doing it. They said that they felt like it would help their family members, that it would might lead to their own better health management, and they were just curious. And those that said no said, which was nearly everybody who declined testing, said that it wouldn't make any difference to their care. And so that is a historical perspective on um, genetic testing for HCM, that it's just going to be difficult. It's not going to make any difference. <clears throat> and it's just sort of passed over. And I think part of that is uh, that the family history can have a very different uh, penetration or uh, presentation. Um, and so we do see truly dominant pattern of family history where we see multi-generational um, uh, affected individuals with parent to child transmission. This is the classic dominant uh, family history. But cardiomyopathies are known for what's called reduced penetrance, which means that you can carry the genetic predisposition and never express the trait, never show any sign or symptom of HCM. So we also see family histories where it seems to be skipping generations or it's just more scattered presentation less obviously a true genetic trait. So these non-penetrant carriers can certainly pass on the risk to their child. And then you also have uh, patients who are the only individual in their family an isolated occurrence of HCM. And this you know, could be truly that they have a new mutation. It could be that they have small families like the pedigree in this example. It could be that they have very little contact with their family. They don't know the medical history of the reasons that their relatives have, have uh, their ancestors have passed away um, or whether it was heart disease. Um, so basically all of these individuals noted, you know, shaded in black who have HCM in this example are good candidates for genetic testing. Although it is true that those families that have a positive family history have younger age of onset, have more complex disease, more ventricular arrhythmia at a young age, they're more likely to have a positive test. So recent studies showed that those families had about 73% positive rate with a standard HCM panel. Those families that had more of an isolated presentation like a single individual or a single individual with HCM um, maybe in, uh, later ages would have a 30% chance of having a positive result. So, you know, whether you have a strong family history or not, it's still going to make a difference to know if you have a positive genetic test result and a 30% yield is not nothing. And a 70% yield for genetic testing is really great. Like that's very informative testing. And it makes a difference to the relatives to know uh, the specific genetic variant, which is what we now call mutations, um, that is in their family because it allows them to do targeted testing. So most of these panels contain um, genes that are the sarcomeric genes, which uh, we've just learned about and how the sarcomere is basically this provides the spring action for contractility. And these mutations in actin and myosin, they account for the vast majority of true classic HCM. Most of the panels also include overlapping conditions that cause hypertrophy. And it is important to do the testing as well, just to see, confirm the etiology of your specific uh, HCM. And that would have implications for your future care. And it would have implications for your family, um, your family's screening. So my end recommendation there is to do testing anyway. 
So a lot of patients in those same or HCMA members in those same surveys, uh, you know, reported that genetic testing and genetic test results are very confusing and they weren't sure what to do with them. And, and that is true. Um, and it is hard to understand how can you have this condition that's genetic and you get negative test results. And it is true that 30 to 70 percent of patients with HCM are going to have negative test results. But this doesn't mean that it's not genetic. It also doesn't mean you don't have HCM. And it certainly doesn't mean that your relatives are not at risk. Um, but when it's positive, it is helpful. And then uh, lots of people talk about variants of unknown significance with uh, all genetic testing. This is a reality because DNA variation is very common. A lot of it is tolerated. A lot of it you know, creates a neutral change. Some of it's damaging. Some of it's probably beneficial and modulates this disease expression in a favorable way. Um, so it's important to remember that genetic test results give uh, probability. Um, the scale or what you will see if you get a, a genetic uh, report, you will see a, a classification of a DNA alteration or variant of unknown significance, a likely pathogenic or pathogenic. And these pathogenic simply means disease causing, so likely pathogenic or pathogenic variants are ones that are very likely the cause of the condition in the patient. And these, are, these variants can be used as informative markers for family screening. Variants of unknown significance cannot be used because we simply don't know if they're related to the heart disease or not. I mean, some of them are more suspicious than others. And then if the um, variants are identified and there are lots of them that are you know, normal, which is benign or likely normal or likely benign, those don't show up on the report those simply come out as a negative result. So this is the schematic for family screening from the uh, recent guidelines. And at the top, we have our HCM patient and the um, decision tree depending on their results. So if they have a disease causing likely pathogenic or pathogenic variant, we can then offer testing, what's called cascade genetic testing to their at-risk relatives. And usually we talk about first degree relatives or FDRs. And those are people one step out from the patient. Those are siblings, offspring, parents, because we do diagnose young people. Sometimes we then turn around and diagnose their parents and say, you need to go see Robbie at the adult clinic. Um, so this is cascade screening and you work out from there. Uh, so if your relative is tested for your variant, and they're positive, they have the opportunity for increased monitoring for rhythm disturbance um, and then uh, echocardiogram screening to, change, to watch for any changes in their thickness or function. And then of course, the relatives that test negative for that familial variant that is found in the HCM patient, they no longer need to be followed. And this is, well, a relief for everybody, but it also really impacts their management. So we start following patients at risk or relatives at risk in childhood. So that's a lot of years of screening. These at-risk relatives no longer need to have just because they're your, the patient with HCM's testing was positive. It's allowed them to find out that they don't have it. So if the HCM patient's testing is uncertain or benign, likely benign, not performed or negative, um, this is not informative for family screening. So these individuals then need to, their at-risk relatives need to be screened by cardiology methods, which is typically EKG, echocardiogram, Holter monitoring. Um, they might rotate in uh, MRI monitoring as well. So this is a slide that's hard to wrap your head around a little bit, but you can see that this is the, uh, these are from the guidelines as well. This is the recommendation for family screening. And you can see that they are starting recommending, the first two rows are in regards to screening children. And in the middle, column, it says that what, when you should you start screening? Well, all of the times recommended to start screening is when 
you, the patient, is diagnosed with HCM. At that time, you tell your relatives that you've been diagnosed, they're at 50-50 risk, and they should start screening. Now, if you have a particularly strong family history, early age of onset, um, a genotype positive type family history, those children should be followed more closely every one to two years by cardiology assessment. Of course, if you have a gene positive result, those children and adolescents could just test for the variant as well, but not everybody wants to test their children in childhood, although it is um, ethically approved by the American College of Medical Genetics to test children for these conditions that do onset in childhood. Okay, and then so for the lower risk category family histories, the screening interval is a little bit relaxed. And for adult relatives, um, the screening is recommended every three to five years. And you know that there is no endpoint, there's no age at which it's recommended for you to stop screening. So say my, I'm 40, and my 35 year old brother was just diagnosed with HCM. I do not say, I'm 40, I'm too old, I'm not at risk. This is not something you're born with. It can onset at any age. You should go get screened and you should screen every three to five years. Um, okay. So lots of people talk about the barriers in our study, our multi-center study showed that barriers were a huge reason for people not pursuing, that it was costly, it was hard to coordinate, you used to have to use blood, but now we use, we use saliva samples, buckles or cheek swabs, kits get mailed to people's homes, they can collect at home, mail it to the lab. The turnaround time used to be 12 weeks or more, now it's usually two or three weeks. Um, lots of the labs offer self-pay options, which is $250. They offer free family testing if they find a mutation in you or a positive result. Say my result is positive, my five siblings and my four children all get testing for that variant for free. Um, there's industry sponsored testing at some of the labs where um, they've partnered with pharmaceutical companies who have an interest in studying this condition and they will do your test at no charge. And importantly, all of the insurance, all of the payers now cover genetic testing. So it is super easy. So one of the limiting factors with genetic testing has always been um, the scarcity of genetic counselors. Uh, and there's not a lot of us, but these things in this area is, it's not too hard. We have two genetic counselors at Sibley. Emory has like 30 genetic counselors. Um, all, a lot of the centers as the genomic revolution is happening are adding genetic counselors. So it's increasingly easy to see somebody in person. But there's also telemedicine genetic counseling. Genome Medical is a, um, a telemedicine counseling group that uh, is a partner of Invitae and uh, Invitae is a laboratory with there's lo logos here um, that offers genetic counseling. So if you just want to schedule genetic counseling with them, you can do that or you can order genetic testing through Invitae sponsored at no charge or insurance pay and use their genetic counselors. Uh, so it's really quite easy now. And you can find all of this information on the HCMA website as well. They've got a very nice summary of genetic um, testing benefits and limitations, as well as links to the actual order test order form uh, for testing. So I, I feel like I breezed through that, but that's probably a good thing. Hope, thank you for your attention. And I um, have my email here, so if anybody has any um, need to ask genetics questions in the future, I'd be happy to do that now or later. Genetic counselors always make really complex genetics to sound is so easy. Uh, <laughs> so I'm, I'm really happy to say that there's more genetic counselors today than there were eight, 10 years ago. Um, they were all kind of heading towards cancer genetics, but they found us. We need them too. Yeah, uh, we appreciate that. And we are working with Invite on the, um, the distribution of the uh, free genetic testing. So if you have anybody in your family who's diagnosed with HCM and you need genetic testing, the link is on our website for hcm.org and you can get free genetic testing. They do offer post-testing counseling, but the pre-testing you have to use a program that Linda just explained. Um, but I think it's really important to speak to a genetic counselor before embarking I've heard so much misinformation 
when somebody who goes ahead and does the genetic testing but doesn't understand what a no mutation found actually means or what a variant of unknown significance actually means and the genetic counselors can help make complicated stuff a whole lot less complicated. So go genetic I try. <laughs> Thank you. Um, we're gonna hold questions because we want Jonathan Kim to be able to give his talk and get some questions in because exercise is always such a hot topic and we know he's on a tight time schedule tonight. So Dr. Kim, I hand it off to you and thank you for your participation tonight. Absolutely, and I'm, I'm pretty sure everybody can hear me and I unmuted myself. Um, so uh, first of all, I just wanna thank you, Lisa, uh, for this invitation. And I wanna thank Robbie and Oslin uh, for directing our HCM Center and including me in this talk here at Emory. It's a, it's a real honor to be part of this webinar. I've been specifically tasked to talk about exercise and hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And it's certainly been a, a evolution relative to where we were five, 10 years ago, for sure, um, to the uh, embracing of shared decision-making, which you've already heard in Oslam's excellent overview talk of the new guidelines. So I'm gonna get a little bit more detail as she mentioned, as it relates to athletes and high-end exercise, but also importantly, since um, most of us aren't competitive athletes, we're gonna talk about exercise in general, as I think this used to be a, a clear taboo and concern from patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And we want to ensure that everybody's aware of the importance of exercise and, and really how the data are showing the safety of moderate aerobic exercise. Here are my disclosures. Uh, again, I do have affiliations with several athletic organizations um, and you can see my research funding, which is uh, relevant to issues related in sports and exercise cardiology. So I have several primary objectives for uh, those listening tonight. Um, and it's gonna culminate in the discussion of exercise. But for, first, we're gonna take a walk down memory lane and talk about the concerns regarding exercise in the context of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And of course, much of these data are relevant to competitive athletes and uh, some of these tragic cases that we all heard about uh, years ago. And we'll do a quick review of risk factors for sudden cardiac death. I, I do believe there's a talk on ICD, so I'm not gonna get into the de details about that. I think Robbie's actually gonna get into that. Uh, but it is relevant to this talk. Going to specifically talk about this most recent RESET HCM trial as it relates to the data looking at the efficacy of exercise and safety of exercise in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And then lastly, uh, Oslam's already introduced the concept, so thank you very much. And I can just take the baton and talk a little bit more about how we utilize shared decision making in the context of exercise and sports participation. So I'm almost embarrassed to show this slide, but it is important, not embarrassed because it's Dr. Marin, of course, um, but just given the date, this is obviously a very old slide. Um, and really, I think the numbers in terms of the prevalence of etiologies of uh, causes of sudden cardiac death in athletes have really changed over the years, but it really still emphasizes that regardless of how things have evolved in terms of uh, reduce rates of sudden cardiac arrest and death in overall patients with HCM. When you talk about cases of sudden cardiac arrest and death in athletes, unfortunately, HCM will always be one of the top causes as it relates to true underlying structural cardiomyopathic uh, etiology. So it's important to, of course, just emphasize that. And we see this in the real world too, not just in competitive athletes. Now, this is a study that we published um, I can't believe almost 10 years ago now, looking at etiologies of sudden cardiac arrest among long distance half marathon and marathon runners. Um, so these were not professional or uh, competitive athletes, but these were high end recreational athletes, of course. And we see when you actually look at etiologies, the red were those who had underlying myocardial ischemia, which is really gonna be your most common cause, particularly in older athletes, but you see HCM scattered throughout. So clearly relevant among all of us uh, in the activities we engage in, and particularly patients with uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and concerns for potential cardiac arrest. So when we talk about sudden cardiac arrest and death among uh, athletes, again, it still will always remain an important cause. It's something that we actively, of course, screen for through the 14-point American Heart Association History and Physical. And there is controversy as it relates to the use of electrocardi electrocardiography, but again, use of ECG in particular to look for potential asymptomatic uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And the proportion of cases as it relates to HCM are gonna be dependent on what registry you look at, as well as the date of the registry published. 
But again, I've already emphasized that it's still an important cause. And it's really important the younger you are. So when we talk about our younger athletes, uh, particularly once you start getting to that hot spot between 17 to 20 years old, the rates of sudden cardiac arrest and death are gonna increase. Um, and of course, this was a study published uh, in 2011, again, showing specific risk factors, this being uh, increased wall thickness. So Robbie's gonna get into risk factors for sudden cardiac death, I believe in the ICD talk. So this is just a quick review and Oslam uh, beautifully mentioned as well, some of the, the new features as it relates to risk factors in the new guidelines and uh, as specifically talking about low ejection fraction. So weakened left ventricular systolic function, uh, scarring, diffuse scarring that can be picked up by cardiac MRI. Uh, we call that delayed gadolinium enhancement or late gadolinium enhancement. Uh, and the presence of LV aneurysm. And with our, uh, the, the improved ability to, of course, uh, detect high-risk features with use of ICD and the medical therapies, now the annual mortality rate, as you heard earlier, is around 0.1%, uh, which has been fairly, re uh, just remarkable if you look at this over uh, the last uh, 5, 10, 20 years, 15 years or so. So knowing that, what is the risk of sudden cardiac death with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy during exercise? And specifically, we're going to talk about not competitive athletes for a minute, but just patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And this is where we get into the RESET HCM trial. So this was a really uh, elegant study. This was a randomized controlled trial, which means that patients were randomized to an exercise regimen or their usual day-to-day -day activities. The study was published at the University of Michigan from friends and colleagues of um, ours, Dr. Sarah Saberi and Charlene Day. Charlene is now at the University of Pennsylvania. And what they did again is randomize a, a group of 136 patients with HCM. And there were various exclusion criteria, which I won't get into in the talk right now. Certainly if there's questions, we can get into this. But it, it did include a wide uh, array of uh, various HCM phenotypes. So this wasn't just picking up the low risk phenotype that didn't have any LGE. Um, these included patients uh, really across the spectrum, but uh, of course, higher risk patients were not included. This is an older group, although still relatively young, I would submit um, at 50 years of age. And patients were randomized to either 16 weeks of moderate intensity exercise training um, or their usual activities. And the primary outcome measure was peak VO2. So that stands for maximum oxygen consumption. Um, you can think about this as a marker of relative cardiovascular efficiency or performance. It's a surrogate for cardiac output, which is a measure of flow of blood circulated through the body uh, based on cardiac function. Of course, that takes into account the relationship between the heart and the lungs, and then ultimately how the muscles uptake that oxygen to make energy. So it really is an overall marker of cardiovascular performance. And of course, we know that higher peak VO2 is good. And uh, again, just to quickly talk about exclusion criteria, it did exclude prior history of ventricular tachycardia, um, an abnormal exercise blood pressure response. You had to be after three months uh, ICD implant or if you had septal reduction therapy. And again, low ejection fraction or low left ventricular systolic function was excluded. Um, pregnancy, severe heart failure symptoms, things that you could probably guess that would be things that you would not want to include in a study such as this. And to cut to the chase, what the uh, authors found, what the group found was that those who exercised did have a significant, a statistically significant rise in peak VO2 after exercise. But what was really most important, I think the key finding of the study was the fact that there were no adverse events. Of course, that includes cardiac arrest, sudden cardiac death, uh, and even ICD shocks as well. So it, it really enforced the safety of a moderate exercise regimen in patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And this is really the first true objective science that really demonstrated this, even though many of us who are caring for these patients believe that most patients could actually exercise uh, safely with HCM. Now, the relative, the rise in peak VO2 in the study was really not that high. Um, it didn't actually meet the threshold for what the authors had targeted in their sample size calculations. But I think it's fair to say that a rise in peak VO2, essentially these patients all uh, then, you could state, uh, uh, they benefited, all the benefits of exercise that you would guess were obtained, um, perhaps to a little bit more of a modest degree, but there was a rise in benefit just in the exercise training as well. 
Now, what about if we shift the discussion a little bit, those who like to engage in higher levels of exercise. So this would be competitive type exercise, of course, but it does include those who engage in high-end recreational exercise as well. So many times uh, I'm asked, and actually I was asked specifically to comment on the differentiation between an athlete versus not an athlete. And really the way we define an athlete is anybody who puts a high premium on competition, training, and performance. So of course, that would clearly include your competitive athlete, um, your competitive collegiate or professional athlete. But I also think it includes those who are recreational and really put a emphasis on how they train and how they challenge themselves when they, when they perform uh, in their own aer aerobic or whatever recreational endeavors they're involved with. So of course, this would include your recreational road race runner, your marathon runner, your half marathon runner. And so, this concept of shared decision-making is not just specific to hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. It's really engaged in a lot of how we approach clinical medicine today. And it's defined as the physician guiding treatment decision and options with the patient going through specific pros and cons, benefits, potential concerns that are all relevant to that specific case, but also integrating the patient-specific values, morals, and their own wishes. And so you can imagine for exercise, typically competitive exercise, how shared decision making could really uh, be impactful and why it would be necessary. Now, one interesting, I think, caveat to how we approach shared decision making for exercise is many times whenever we approach shared decision making, it's about a treatment decision, um, whether it be a, a device implant or initiation of a medicine. Exercise while medicine is also very much a lifestyle choice. And when we're talking about competitive type exercise, that's a little bit of a nuance that I think offers additional challenges to this process for your recreational or competitive athlete. But shared decision-making in athletes has really come about due to some important data in other populations. Uh, we thank data from Mike Ackerman at the Mayo Clinic showing us the safety of exercise and sport participation in patients with a congenital long QT syndrome which is a congenital arrhythmia syndrome that is associated with sudden death, but under appropriate medical management, you can, you can participate safely. Specifically, uh, that's what he has shown in their registry. And Rachel Lampert is an electrophysiologist at, the, uh, at Yale, and she has in her registry of patients, athletes with, in, uh, with ICDs, showing the safety of sport participation as well in those who initially chose to continue to compete uh, in athletics or exercise when they were told not to. And she has shown nicely that actually, indeed, there's safety. There's not the concerns that you would anticipate, at least in those sports that are not contact sports. So you've heard a little bit about this with the HCM 2020 guidelines as it relates to exercise. And these are really, the, I think, one of the, the key pieces to these guidelines and really, really important. Well, first, again, I think we can look to the Reset HCM trial. It's now a class uh, one recommendation. Patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, mild to moderate exercise is beneficial for all the reasons that exercise is beneficial for the rest of us. And we don't want patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy to remain static and develop all these other traditional cardiovascular risk factors um, that they can still obviously harbor. Now, when it comes to competitive act exercise, this is where it now becomes a more to be recommendation. This is consensus. And just introducing that if one engages or continues to engage in high-end competitive or recreational exercise, it should really be after very detailed shared decision-making conversations with a specialist. This should be performed at a center such as Emory, that's a HCM center where there's other experts that potentially could be involved. And this should always be reassessed. After that first decision, you assess this at some um, uh, surveillance period, whether it's a year or sooner than that, um, it should always be re-engaged. And I think Oslin actually mentioned this before, and it's a really important point. A shared decision-making dis uh, discussion should never be a one and done. It can't be fit into your 15-minute follow-up. Um, it really extends beyond multiple visits. And I actually love the way she described it, where it was having additional meetings, which I do routinely with athletes, not just for HCM, but with other conditions where you get all the stakeholders involved. It's the athlete. It's the family members involved. So for my older recreational athletes, asking their spouse to be a part of this discussion, because that's really important. For the competitive athlete, of course, if they're at a university, getting other key stakeholders, the athletic director, the director, the team physician, it really requires everybody being on the same page. And again, trying to make this a athlete patient-centered approach, highlighting that and then making sure all, all key parties are involved. 
So Emory Sports Cardiology is heavily uh, involved with the HCM Center uh, at Emory, as you can imagine. The crossover between HCM and athletes, particularly for our young athletes, is not uncommon. And so we have a, a, a nice working relationship. We utilize a lot of cardiopulmonary exercise testing to help define heart rate zones, the, the maximum aerobic zones that a patient may have to help try to delineate an exercise prescription for uh, patients who want to engage in various levels of exercise and they have underlying hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. So with that, um, again, another quick breeze just to discuss a little bit about the evolution of exercise in HCM. Um, to summarize, again, we know there's classically been concern regarding exercise and patients with HCM and concern of precipitation of sudden cardiac arrest or, of course, sudden cardiac death. Um, it still remains a common cause of sudden cardiac death. But we, uh, and there's, we understand that there is risk stratification necessary for HCM to evaluate uh, risk of sudden death potentially necessitating ICD implant. But what about those who don't require ICD? Well, HCM can be unpredictable uh, and sudden cardiac arrest can be unpredictable in these cases. And again, that's where this concept of sheer decision-making for those who want to engage in higher levels of uh, sport and exercise participation comes, uh, uh, becomes possible and necessary. But it's important to remember that exercise is medicine. Uh, even for patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and other cardiac conditions. And uh, the data clearly show that at this stage. And for athletes uh, or those who want to engage in higher levels of physical activity, proceeding with sheer decision-making may be appropriate. Thank you very much. I'll take some questions. Here's my Twitter handle, uh, always updating issues as it relates to uh, sports cardiology, which many times involves HCM. So follow me. And uh, again, thank you for your attention. Thank you so much for that important conversation. I, I do want to remind everybody that tomorrow on Tales from the Heart, which will be broadcast live off of our Facebook page, um, we are going to take a deep dive into an individual case on an adult, non-collegiate, non-professional who got diagnosed with HCM but was obsessed with hockey in a good way and how he made decisions to participate and at what level and what happened. It's kind of a dramatic story. Uh, it's got some twists and turns, so tune in tomorrow to hear it, but it's a real practical application of shared decision-making and how it works out well for everybody. So I'm going to just pause here for a moment, um, Robbie, just, uh, uh, Dr. Kim has to leave at eight o'clock on the dot. If anybody has a question specifically related to him, speak now so we make sure it gets addressed. So I'm gonna just scroll through here and on. Okay, do you suggest patients go through cardiac exercise analysis to figure out what exercise level they can do? So many folks don't know what they can do. So I personally would love to see insurers pay for a short stint of cardiac rehab to teach patients with HCM what's normal and what's not. I know we've done those um, kind of like one-off situations. Is there value here? Is this something we should be looking at? What do you think? Yeah, well, you know, if you look at the RESET study, the way they define moderate exercise is they used a specific calculation where they used uh, something called heart rate reserve, which is taking a maximum heart rate during exercise, which can be estimated, subtracting the resting heart rate, and then adding the resting heart rate to that. And so you get a specific number. I think that actually kind of correlates and lines up to where somebody's uh, anaerobic threshold or how we can measure that if you're not measuring blood lactates, the ventilatory threshold on a cardiopulmonary exercise test. And so actually I agree that we can be very helpful to patients um, who are very interested in this. So, you know, if somebody I think wants to engage in um, you know, they're not, a, they're not a recreational athlete, they just wanna be active and they wanna comply with AHA 150 minutes a week, probably don't necessarily need all of this because these patients, these individuals are just wanting to get out and go for a jog or get on the elliptical. And they're not pushing themselves and wanting to do high intensity interval training. So it may not be necessary. And there's probably a bit more of a qualitative art to that. I'm sure Robbie can talk uh, about that as well. But there are many patients, particularly those that were diagnosed that used to be an athlete or are still involved in active endeavors where they're pushing themselves and they, they're asking that specific question. 
And that is where we utilize CPET testing quite a bit because this can actually specifically give them where their heart rate is at their maximum aerobic zone, which is essentially that kind of at the upper limit of a moderate exercise type effort. Um, and they can use that and they can use that in terms of, um, you know, how they build that into their exercise regimen throughout the day. Some of these other things can be calculated as well, um, for sure. I mean, you don't necessarily have to measure that. So many institutions have CPET available, but they tend to use it more for their heart failure population, um, which I think is actually quite unfortunate because um, can be very helpful in the general cardiology world uh, uh, spectrum as well. But uh, certainly at I think high-end HCM centers for excellence, like knowing other centers across the country and colleagues of mine, those type capabilities are available and that can be, uh, they can be used to answer the, the person's question. I think you actually bring up a great point that could go on uh, one of our committee's to-do lists. Um, it, this may be coming more from a regulatory point of view in terms of reimbursement um, to make sure that this gets done and showing the value. So we may need a few more studies behind it Reset was a great start. I was really happy to be able to kind of kickstart that with an early survey back in like 2007, um, and that turned into Reset. Um, and we were very happy to be part of the early ICD and athletes registry data as well. So we're, we're pushing towards these answers, but I think we need uh, uh, to get a little bit more organized, get a little bit more strategic and answer those direct questions so that hopefully we can get payment and reimbursement. And it's, I think, really important. Anne is asking another question. Um, uh, she's asking, can moderate exercise increase a patient's ejection fraction over time? Considering this is a group with a super normal ejection fraction for the most part, does, is exercise doing anything to the EF? Probably, you know, ejection fraction is such a crude estimate of, I mean, as you well know, of LV systolic function. So I think the answer to the question is it's not going to increase ejection fraction. Um, now, what exercise can do is certainly make the cardiovascular function more efficient um, and uh, in, in terms of kind of aerobic capacity. And of course, that leads to all these health benefits that we all talk about, both physically and even uh, mentally as well. And one thing that's important, because there is another inherited condition that um, we know about, something called ARVC or arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy, which is another genetic cardiomyopathy. And we know, unfortunately, that exercise actually makes that phenotype worse. It, it makes the RV much more scarred, fatty, and, and unfortunately accelerates the heart failure kind of um, uh, presentation. There are no data to date that um, suggests that even high-end exercise can do the same thing for HCM. So that's always kind of one of these questions, always could this make, not necessarily the HCM worse, but could it lead to downstream issues that could be a problem if I like to particularly engage in a lot of exercise. And there are no data to support that, right? At, at least right now, which is good. So I think diving into that a little bit more, athlete's heart versus HCM is always that gray zone crossover. Yep. So I think where that question might have been getting at is can exercise over time lead to hypertrophy like athlete's heart on top of HCM? And I would say that's exceedingly rare, if ever. Yeah, no, and, you, and when you talk about the gray zone, and uh, it was great, you know, uh, Martinez was texting me here a little bit too, kind of yeah. chiming in. He's always causing trouble, but uh, this is obviously, I'm, I'm, third, I'm sure you've heard him talk about all the time, which is this gray zone, extreme athletic remodeling versus mild HCM. And there are, you know, this is where it starts getting kind of more anecdotal in terms of can, you know, we've talked about detraining as well. So if somebody has gray zone LVH, left ventricular hypertrophy, and you're not sure, is this HCM or is this just a big time athlete who's a linebacker and does a lot of weightlifting or a wrestler and that's why their heart's thickened up, which is it? Um, and some people will say, well, if you detrain them, it should shrink up if it was all sport related because now you've taken away the sports stimulus. There's some small data to suggest that there is some regression with detraining, um, but the data aren't that robust to be honest. And there are also some of these anecdotal stories that you hear about where the detraining worked uh, and then they went back to exercise and then they hypertrophied up and actually the phenotype was, was over uh, an obvious HCM. So um, clearly if you have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy and you're engaged in a sport that promotes LV thickening, it's possible I think that you could um, certainly uh, add to that thickness over time. Um, and that's one of the challenges of course when we just talk about the gray zone in general. But 
that whole science of if somebody is in that intermediate, you know, they're a little too thick to be an athlete, but maybe they're at the extreme where they've got really mild HCM is a whole science. And of course that is where sports cardiology really comes into play. And uh, certainly Robbie, uh, uh, we, we, we've cared for many patients together where this is a, a challenge to say the least. Fantastic. We have a couple more questions and this one's kind of funny because we didn't define it before we use the word. What is CPAT as the question said, which says that nobody really knows what CPAT is. Oh, so, uh, so, so I apologize for that. That's so it. CPAT stands for cardiopulmonary exercise testing. It's just a form of exercise testing where we measure VO2. And so um, you wear a mask and it's attached to a metabolic cart that basically takes in um, uh, it measures your inhaled oxygen your in and your exhaled carbon dioxide, and it measures specifically that con that VO2 I talked about, which is oxygen consumption and a measure of cardiovascular performance. And so we've all heard about peak VO2 for sure. When you talk, you know, when you heard about Lance Armstrong back in the day and what his peak VO2 was um, and all that type stuff. So this is actually how we measure it. Um, but it's important to note that this isn't really that fancy of a test, meaning, as mentioned, pretty much all hospitals have this. It is reimbursed. It's, a, it's, a, it's an exercise stress test. So this isn't something where you have to jump through hoops to try to get, uh, get these reimbursed uh, by insurance companies, because it's, it's just like doing a treadmill test, but you get a heck of a lot more information. And rather than estimating this concept called METS, which, is how, which stands for a metabolic uh, equivalent of task, and that's this, this thing we use in cardiology to know how fit somebody is and how functional they are. And we always guess it when somebody gets on the treadmill, we say, oh, somebody has X number of METs, so they're highly functional, but we really don't know it. CPET actually directly measures that because a MET is calculated off of VO2. Um, so we get all this information. And the other thing that it can give is delineating some of these heart rate zones. So you can guess where somebody switches from zone three to zone four to wherever. Um, particularly whenever they're engaged in, uh, you know, when they, when they like to keep measures of that when they exercise. And again, it's not guessing, you're actually getting these direct measures. So cardiopulmonary exercise test or CPET. I'm gonna put a couple of these questions together and just have you comment in general. Do you recommend lightweight lifting like two to five pounds only, or can there be some aerobic exercise? Um, another issue is our competitive sports more dangerous for patients with HCM because of adrenaline rush or ischemia? What is the nidus point for an arrhythmia? So can you give us some guidelines on types of exercises that are good and tell us how to stay out of that, you know, cardiac arrest zone? Sure. So light weights, I would be totally fine with, uh, you know, mixing in light to moderate weights in combination with a moderate ex aerobic exercise regimen. Um, in general, um, I would think would be would be reasonable. I think reset kind of teaches us that that uh, now they obviously incorporate a, an isometric training component to that, but I think there's some fair extrapolation as it relates to risk. That is the whole kind of when you start getting the shared decision making, and so that's the challenge. So if somebody has the mildest form of HCM, but they've seen Oslam, they've seen Robbie, I've seen them. We all in agreement. We think this is a mild form of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy that's whenever you have to have these discussions. So low risk, if you think they have a mild phenotype does not equal zero risk. That's kind of this line, generic line that we utilize quite often, but it really aptly describes this process of shared decision-making and first having the athlete and the other stakeholders understand this kind of risk assessment. Um, and, and that's where these meetings really take shape and require multiple meetings because you got to get to know that athlete you can't just assume they know what you're talking about <laughs> because it's very complex and you want the other stakeholders involved, the parents. Um, and I typically do that. You kind of introduce the concept, you go home, you talk about it, and then we continue to have that discussion while obviously in involving, um, you know, the school, the team, et cetera. So, so let me stop yes, there for a second yeah. because there's two very, actually three very different groups of people. There are children and the pediatric guidelines for competitive athletics. That's got a big asterisk in it because that's really complicated because it's yeah. parent making decisions, school making decisions, child making an opinion uh, as to what they want. Then we have student athletes that are adults and professional collegiate like level 
But then there's the place where the big majority of people are, and that's just good old adults who like to be part of a team and go out and play hockey or volleyball or be on a league or a team, but are adults and have real lives and are weekend yeah. warriors. What ha, We're going to be talking tomorrow about the latter there, the, the weekend yeah. warrior type, the, the adult competitive athlete. So are they way different to you? Or are they the same to you? Well, they're similar in the sense that for those that are really putting a high premium on that, um, the, that shared risk discussion is the same. The stakeholders are different, of course, because this is an individual who can do whatever they want. They can sign up for whatever event and take whatever risks they want. And that's the individual where I, I, I try to encourage having um, you know, their spouse involved. You know, have that discussion at home because it's, it, it obviously encompasses the stakeholders are more than just the individual. Sometimes it is just the in, individual, but it's still that same kind of approach and the taking the time to go through um, where the risks may lie. And to go back to the question of the risks of competitive exercise and the adrenaline, the answer is, is certainly there, there is some undefined risk. I would think that for those that have a low risk phenotype of HCM. The thickness is not that extreme. There's no scar. You've done the, the, the rhythm monitoring. There's no episodes of non-sustained ventricular tachycardia when they're sleeping or doing things. Their blood pressure response is robust. We've done a cardiopulmonary exercise test and their VO2 is off the chart. I mean, everything checks off. No family history of sudden death. That's where I think proceeding with shared decision making is reasonable. Some would say, like Dr. Day, actually, I think really thinks that there is a, uh, a an upper boundary on what uh, patients with HCM can do from a competitive athletic standpoint. Um, but I think the point is, is that no matter even if on you're really down on that mild spectrum, there is some risk entailed. Uh, and that, I think, is the challenge of having the acceptance. But I found that just by going through this stepwise approach that I've always felt very comfortable for the athletes that have chosen to continue on really understand it. And I've had one actually collegiate athlete for two years continued on. And then by the time they hit their senior year, they said, I'm, that's it. I'm done. You know, like I, I've every year I go through this and I made the decision that I don't need the competitive part, even though my risk is low and respected the decision. I mean, that was, that was actually one of the best examples I think of that kind of shared partnership of, of everybody understanding, then ultimately having the patient-centered decision to could really drive it along the way. Okay, one last question, and we're going to jump off to, to Robbie's talk. Um, some of these other questions really fall into other areas, so we will get to them. Um, anaerobic exercise, yes, no, just clarify that. Yeah, so there's, there's, I don't think there are the data out there to really demonstrate the, the, the risk. Um, uh, threshold dramatically increasing. I think there are some studies, I can't quote them off the top of my head, but I know there are some smaller ones that, uh, again, whenever you're at that anaerobic zone with buildup of lactate, again, theoretically, when you think about having the substrate of the thickened myocardium and adrenaline that somebody mentioned as well, that perhaps that's where the potential risk could be highest. And so generally um, speaking, that's where I think uh, I kind of use that cut point below um, as it relates to focusing more on the aerobic zones. Now, if somebody engages in HIT type training, is that dangerous or bad? I, I would, I, I can't say that um, for sure. And again, I think that would all fall in line with a, a shared decision with that specific individual. If they really like to engage in activities such as that. Okay, thank you for all the answers. Without further ado, we're gonna let the guy who kicked this all off talk about ICDs and some of the questions that you posted about ICDs in the Q&A pass uh, we'll probably address in the next few minutes. So Robbie, off to you. Thank you, Lisa. Did I unmute myself? Yes. And I shared my screen without saying shared my screen. So um, again, thank you to Lisa for including us. I want to thank my co-presenters for donating their their time and expertise this evening. Um, and again, I'm Robbie Williams. I am uh, the uh, work at the adult uh, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy clinic at Emory University in Atlanta. And I am gonna talk to you a little bit about how we decide which patients need a defibrillator. I have no uh, relevant financial relationship to disclose. 
and I should say I am not an electrophysiologist, which means I'm not the person that puts in these devices. I, I let my colleagues that do that put in those devices. I just hopefully help the patients decide um, what they need. So as the anchor leg, a lot of this stuff has been touched on in earlier talks, um, but um, we'll go through some of it again. So sudden cardiac death, an important topic, uh, a scary topic, but certainly um, a, a potential fact of life for patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And as was mentioned in earlier talks, the in the early days of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, and this, you know, in the 1950s and 60s into the 1970s, sort of from London and the National Institutes of Health, as they were sort of first describing this disease and learning about it, the early estimates of sudden cardiac death were, were quite high and scary to the as high as 6% annually. Um, but as time's gone on and our understanding of the disease has gone on, we, we realized that was probably a bit of an overestimation, probably again, as Oslo mentioned due to referral biases or sicker patients that see, being seen at uh, referral institutions as we sort of broaden the scope. We now know that that risk is somewhat lower and depends on where you look and who you ask, but thought to be a good bit less than 1% per year for all comers and patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And compare that to the general population, which is less than 0.1% sudden cardiac death, you see it's it's certainly higher than the general population, but not several orders of magnitude as was initially feared when this disease was uh, described. One big difference, and this has been touched on also, is, is the distribution in terms of age. In patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, this tends to be a problem of younger adults or even uh, uh, pediatric age patients versus in the general population, sudden cardiac death tends to become more common from other causes like coronary disease being most common or congestive heart failure. Those tend to occur later in life. So those tend to increase in prevalence with age, whereas with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy, sudden cardiac death can actually decrease in prevalence as the patient gets older. But there's clearly a subset of patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy that are at increased risk for sudden cardiac death. And that's one of our jobs as physicians is to identify those patients and treat them. And the treatment, as has been mentioned, is primarily implantable defibrillators or ICDs. So yet again, the guidelines. So they, they loom large over all these talks, but rightly so. So um, this is the section that dealt with uh, assessment of sudden cardiac death. Um, so the they did recommend that a, an, a patient with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy should have a risk assessment at initial evaluation then approximately every one to two years. So it's an ongoing process throughout a patient's life. Uh, and the assessment includes the following, uh, looking for a personal history of cardiac arrest or sustained ventricular arrhythmias, a personal history of syncope or fainting that is thought to be due to arrhythmias or abnormal heart rhythms. It's not due to things like severe dehydration or your doctor gave you too much blood pressure medicines that it's thought to be due to abnormal heart rhythms. Uh, we assess if a patient has a family history and a close relative of premature HCM-related sudden death, cardiac arrest, or again, sustained ventricular arrhythmias, again, in a close relative, like a first-degree relative as a parent, a sibling, or a child. We assess LV wall thickness, ejection fraction, and look for LV apical aneurysm. This is generally done with imaging, such as echocardiogram, and we assess for non-sustained ventricular tachycardia episodes or abnormal heart rhythms on continuous ambulatory electrocardiographic monitoring, also known as a Holter monitor. So these are all class one recommendations or things that pretty much everyone agrees are beneficial. They also recommend class one cardiac MRI, which has also been mentioned several times, is a very beneficial part of our patient assessment. And that's why a lot of you that are patients out there probably undergone cardiac MRIs, that we can, again, get a very accurate assessment of maximum wall thickness, ejection fraction, look for LV apical aneurysms. And the one thing that cardiac MRI provides that echocardiography cannot provide is assessment of myocardial fibrosis or late gadolinium enhancement. That's something that we cannot do with echocardiogram, but is done very well with MRI. So this is sort of a, 
a rough sketch of sort of how we think about patients and sort of the series of questions we ask. So first is we're sort of trying to assess in our mind this a, pa a given patient's risk of sudden cardiac death. We'll ask first, does this patient have a history of prior sudden cardiac death or sustained VT? Uh, you know, obviously sustained uh, sudden cardiac death that they survived or sustained ventricular tachycardia. If the answer to those questions is yes, then that's a pretty clear cut very strong indication for ICD. These patients would be at very high risk of future events of sudden cardiac death. If the answer is no. The next set of questions will include, do they have a family history of sudden cardiac death in a close relative, maximum wall thickness of 30 millimeters or more, more than one recent syncopal episodes, again, thought to be due probably to abnormal heart rhythms. Do they have an LV apical aneurysm or do they have reduced ejection fraction defined as ejection fraction less than 50%. The answer to any of those questions is yes, and this would be what we call a 2A, or a probably an ICD is a good idea for these patients. If all those answers are, answer all those questions is no, the next set of questions is do they have non-sustained ventricular tachycardia on a Holter monitor, which is a monitor they wear at home for 24 to 48 hours, or do we see excessive delayed enhancement on the cardiac MRI or excessive scar in the ventricle and cardiac MRI? The answer to either of those questions is yes, then possibly an ICD may be beneficial. And again, this is where we get back into, and I mention it again later, the, probably the theme of the evening, which has been shared decision-making. Um, this is where a, a discussion will have. These patients are probably, again, probably at increased risk, and probably would benefit from an ICD, but we would again have that discussion with patients and some of their family members that includes the risks and benefits of getting an ICD, how it would impact their, their daily lives, et cetera. If the answer to all these questions are no, then probably this patient is at sufficiently low risk that they do not need a defibrillator. So that's sort of the way we think about these patients. Um, and the, and there's another, there's a whole other set of way we can think about it. In 2014, the European Society of Cardiology came out with their own somewhat similar risk calculator for sudden cardiac death that looked at a variety of risk factors, some similar, some a little bit different. But the European Society of Cardiology, their risk calculator, and this is a, a, a website you can go to or a little app you can get on your phone and you plug in various data points and include the patient's age, maximum wall thickness, the left atrial size as uh, measured by echocardiogram, the peak left ventricular outflow track gradient also measured by echocardiogram, and then whether or not they have a family history of sudden cardiac death at a young age, do they have non-sustained ventricular tachycardia on Holter monitor, or do they have unexplained fainting episodes? So again, some of these risk factors are similar, including maximum wall thickness, family history, non-sustained VT, unexplained syncope. But there are some unique um, uh, indicators in the European societies, such as patient's age. In their calculator, as you get older, your risk actually goes down. Uh, as your left atrium gets bigger, your risk goes up, which is not included in our sort of, in our risk assessment here on the American side of the Atlantic Ocean. Um, and left ventricular outflow tract gradient is traditionally not included in our risk assessment. Um, but it's just another tool we can use, particularly for some of those patients that maybe fall into this sort of gray or, or, or in here, orange-ish zone, where it's like, maybe, maybe not. We can then lean on the European Society calculator and see what sort of number we get. And maybe that helps us sort of push us a little bit in one way or the other when we're having these discussions with the patient. So when you put the data into this calculator, you get, uh, it provides you with a five-year cumulative risk of sudden cardiac death. And the recommendations that they provide is if that five-year risk is less than 4%, they would say this patient's at sufficiently low risk to um, not need an ICD or defibrillator. Uh, if they're from four to 6%, they fall in the gray zone. And if they're above 6%, then that would be a higher risk patient that would probably benefit from defibrillator placement where the, the benefit of a defibrillator would outweigh the risk in doing so. 
So the other thing that the guidelines touch on is the type of device. As we, as sort of time goes on, there are more and more types of defibrillators. Just an interesting historical note, the first patient to ever receive an implantable defibrillator was a young man with, with HCM um, who had already experienced two prior episodes, if I am recalling the story correctly, of, of who'd had two prior cardiac arrests and survived uh, two previous arrests, was the first patient to receive uh, an implantable defibrillator is much bigger than the smaller, more sleek ones we have now, but there are several types of defibrillators. There's the newest type, which is a subcutaneous ICD, which is all under the skin with none of the hardware inside the chest cavity. Uh, many of you uh, may have heard about this or know people that have this device, sort of the, the generator, uh, it sort of rests underneath the armpit and then this uh, lead that is tunneled underneath the skin on top of the rib cage, or the more traditional single chamber ICD where the, uh, the generator is underneath the collarbone and then the wire goes into a vein and down into the right ventricle, a dual chamber ICD, which has a lead in the right ventricle and the right atrium and five ventricular, it actually has three leads, one in the right ventricle, right atrium, and then one that sort of wraps around in something called the coronary sinus that can pace the left side of the heart it's beyond the scope of this talk to sort of delve into the specifics of what these different devices do. Suffice it to say, they all are appropriate for hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. They've all been shown to be effective, very effective at reducing the risk of sudden cardiac death. In fact, these are really the only tools that we have to substantially reduce the risk of sudden cardiac death in patients with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. And which device you would receive, that's a conversation that you would have with the electrophysiologist, which is the physician that implants the devices. They could go over the sort of different features and risks and benefits of each of these particular types of devices. A few additional points I just want to touch on before closing. Interesting to note in this most recent set of guidelines, we talked about it in the exercise uh, talk earlier, but actually exercise testing as a predictor of sudden cardiac death was de-emphasized in this most recent round of, of guidelines. Uh, we still use it a lot, as Dr. Kim mentioned, we use it to assess patient's exercise capacity, uh, to look for other, uh, other cardiac issues during exercise, uh, et cetera. So it's still an important tool in our toolkit, but its role in predicting sudden cardiac death has been somewhat de-emphasized in this latest round. So for those of you that are seeing physicians, you may, uh, your, doc, your physicians may not be getting quite as many exercise tests on you moving forward as a, as a tool to try to predict whether or not you need a defibrillator. What do we do with patients over the age of 60? So, you know, as time's gone on and we've learned more and more about this disease and, and the risk of sudden death, uh, and, and recent studies would suggest that patients, once they get over the age of 60, their risk of sudden cardiac death really starts to go down pretty dramatically. And so what do we do with these patients? These patients, once they hit 60 and older, do we continue to do these battery of tests, echoes and holters and you know, possibly MRIs and things of that nature uh, once they get over the age of 60? And I, we've taken the the approach of having a discussion with our patients in the vein of shared decision-making and sort of going over the continued risks and uh, albeit small, but the, certainly the expense and time involved in doing this testing and whether the patients would wanna continue. And I, for me personally, it has to do, I think a lot of it with perceived risk. I think of a patient sort of in that orange zone where they're a maybe, but haven't gotten a defibrillator yet or not wanted a defibrillator in the past, even if they're over the age of 60, that might be a patient that I want to continue testing. If we, this is a patient we've been testing for years and they appear to be very low risk, once they hit the age of 60, we'll oftentimes offer them the, the option of no longer doing this testing long as, as long as they continue to feel well and appear to be at low clinical risk. And then again, like I said, the theme of the night. When it comes to defibrillators, like a lot of these, uh, you know, things we discussed, whether it's undergoing surgical myectomy, undergoing genetic testing, exercise regimens, or undergoing an ICD. A lot of this comes down to the shared decision-making, a conversation between the physician, the patient, and other important members uh, uh, you know, of the family or other sh um, shared stakeholders in the decision-making process. So you know, having this 
discussion about the risks and benefits of getting a defibrillator, what it means for them in terms of how it will impact their daily life are all very important and important part of their understanding of what it means to have a defibrillator. And that is all I have this evening. Thank you very much for your attention. Thank you, Robbie. That was great. And I think you answered a couple of the questions that were in the queue. Um, as we go through questions, I just wanna remind everybody, we are still streaming on Facebook. We've been doing it the whole time. Um, but what we're going to do in just a few moments is we're going to take down that feed and just kind of stay in the room and take off the recording. So if you have any questions that you want publicly answered and you think will be helpful to the community, you can ask them now. Um, so I'm gonna go over a couple of things here. We are closing in on the eight o'clock hour. So I'm going to start with the exercise related questions which a few more did pop up. Um, and Barbara, I think, I think the answer to this question is going to be to the negative, but has anybody been able to document that mild intensity or moderate intensity exercise can reduce shortness of breath as associated to HCM or chest pressure while walking and exercising regularly? So is exercise a therapy for chest discomfort and shortness of breath? Yeah, and I, 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 uh, I don't think so. Um, and I, I think for sure, um, if there are exertional symptoms with an underlying diagnosis of HCM, then of course you got to start thinking about obstruction and all these other things. Um, now, if there's shortness of breath related to deconditioning um, or some other reason, hypertension, um, hypertensive heart disease in the setting of HCM, uh, and then one engages in aerobic exercise, sure, it's possible that exercise can improve those. But as it relates to shortness of breath related to the HCM phenotype, um, I don't believe so. Okay. Robbie, did you want to chime in on anything there? No, I mean, I completely agree that, that right, it's probably not going to make your, your chest pain uh, better. Um, but as Dr. Kim mentioned, shortness of breath, particularly if shortness of breath is due to deconditioning, you know, obesity, et cetera. In fact, the, you know, one of the findings of uh, this, the study from Michigan was that the exercise capacity of those patients did improve, their quality of life improved. So, you know, it, it certainly will make you feel better, but is it a cure for your exertional chest pain? Yeah, I, I agree. Probably the answer is no, that's better, better treated with medications and possibly septal reduction therapy. So while this is not necessarily a sports cardiology question, it is an activity level concern. We didn't talk about weight loss. We didn't talk about weight management tonight, but it is a, an ongoing challenge for the HCM community. How do you have a heart that's too thick and doesn't quite work right and take beta blockers and not have a lot of energy to use for exercise and how do you get weight off with HCM? Yeah, that's a challenge. And if I had an easy answer for that one, I wouldn't be here um, talking to you guys tonight. I'd be off on my yacht somewhere <laughs> um, counting my money. But you know, right, it's, it's, a, it's a difficult question. You're right, it's when it's difficult for them to, when they have limiting cardiac symptoms due to significant disease. Obviously, we will do everything in our part to minimize those symptoms, be it medications and septal reduction therapy to get them feeling better. But ultimately, you're right, there may be a ceiling that they can achieve in terms of exercise. So it just, you know, the dietary component, it becomes even that much more important. So, you know, talking with them about their diet and having them see a nutritionist. And, um, you know, we've obviously, we've sent patients for bariatric therapies, you know, sur even surgical therapies in some cases. And, you know, it's, it sometimes takes a little uh, convincing of our surgical colleagues or massaging or even arm twisting of our surgical colleagues to, to want to um, perform those procedures. But when needed, they can uh, be beneficial. We've had patients that have, under, that have done that uh, relatively safely and, and uh, done okay, I, you know, not huge numbers as you might imagine, but, but some. So, it, you know, it's, it's an option in sort of the more extreme cases. I have a book recommendation. I am working on it now. I'm doing it through audibles. You can see the name. It is called Hooked 
My friend, Michael Moss, is actually the author. Michael also wrote the book, Sugar, Salt, Fat, How the Food Giants Are Killing Us. Great book. But I think some of what we all need to know, because face it, we all have our trigger foods and we all have our guilty pleasures. If you start to understand the chemistry that goes on and the upward battle that we have to how these foods are designed to intrude, to, to bring us in and to actually make our brains light up as if we we're having heroin, <laughs> we really need to understand what we're eating, how it's affecting our brain and thereby how it's affecting our body. And maybe if we start to look at things as to what are our trigger foods that our brain and our body are not communicating right on, maybe that's a first step. And it, it is literally breaking an addiction. I'm a chocoholic. I fully admit it. I own this. Uh, yes, I'm sure there's others here. And we have co coffeeholics, coffeeaholics, and we have, yeah, we all know what those foods are that trigger our brain to say more, 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 more. We need to cleanse them out of our system and try to reprogram our brain, which by the way, this programming started in infancy. So it's really hard to break. But if you maybe take a little lesson from this book, it's fabulous. I'm going to try to get Michael on to do a podcast with me. It's amazing the science that they've uncovered that might, you know, it's not the answer to HCM and obesity or weight management issues. It's just the human condition and what's available for us to consume. So there's, there's my pitch, Hooked by Michael Moss. Now on audibles, um, I'm on chapter three and I'm already like, oh my God, I'm never going to break these addictions, but I think I can do it if I try. Okay. Um, so I answered your weight loss question. We don't have great answers, but we're working on it. Okay. I have HCM, genetic positive aunt, uncle, sister positive. My four kids haven't had genetic testing due to life insurance, but have had echoes from the cardiologist and everything's good for right now. Should I be concerned about my, oh, wow, you just took a turn here. Should I be concerned about my kids in athletics? And we just lost John, but that's okay. Um, Robbie can handle this one. So a little bit of genetics, a little bit of Gina, and then we'll go off to Robbie. Linda, up to you. Well, you are correct that life insurance is not one of the protected entities under the Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act. Um, and obviously not covered by the Affordable Care Act, which covers health insurance uh, discrimination. Um, you know, and I do have a couple of patients who have not tested their children for that reason. They've tried to obtain life insurance prior to testing and been told that they will not. Some of, one of them had trouble getting it just based on family history. So that is real. Um, so yes, yeah, so there's that as far as you, you know, the other, I don't think there's any way to get around that. I mean, the life insurance, that is not a protected thing. That's just keep shopping around for a plan and see if you can get somebody that will work with you for a reasonable premium and go ahead and insure your kids. Um, you know, there's a 50% chance they're going to be negative, right? It's a 50-50 for each one. It might turn out that none of them have it and aren't at risk. Uh, so that is a great benefit. So, but yes, that is tough. Um, and I just want to note too, that with Gina, it, that, that applies to health insurance, as I mentioned, but it doesn't apply to people who get their um, plan through employers with less teen employees. So that is something for other people to think about as far as future insurance discrimination for healthcare. So yeah, and then, you know, working in pediatrics, we all the time get referral from pediatricians to, for, for sports clearance because of a, parent, a family history of HCM. And, um, you know, we definitely recommend doing the testing. Um, you know, we do go back to the shared decision making. I mean, they're not going to not clear student athletes who are unaffected. You know, usually even if they're gene positive, but unaffected, they still get cleared to play. So I don't think that's going to be an issue for your student athletes who are unaffected and as yet not tested genetically. So I, I want to pause there for a moment regarding the life insurance um, access issue. Number one, I would check with parents, employers on the availability of group life insurance. You can typically buy half of the value of what the parent has through an employer program. 
And oftentimes those programs are portable and you can take them with you. We have a couple that I got for my daughter when she was young and okay, there's 20 grand there, there's 40 grand there. And so we're building up her family's life insurance coverage because she's diagnosed with HCM. So over time we go through the group policies. I am this close, this close people to a membership benefit of the HCMA being a small life insurance policy. It's not gonna be the numbers that people want, but if we can go in and we can start with a $10,000 policy and then we show them that we really do behave ourselves, maybe in a couple of years we can get them to up the value. So everybody has to stay well, <laughs> but there will be in to maybe get it to raise, but we're in the final round of paperwork back and forth so each family member would have to become a member to have a policy and then it would be group policy through HCMA. So that would be kind of game changer. It's not the biggest policy in the world, but it's enough in times of tragedy to get through some of those expenses. And that's kind of what some people might need it for. So it's a possibility. Robbie, now let's talk about, I'm a gene positive family with kids. What should I do with my kids? Yeah, I mean, I agree with Linda that that um, as long as the um, even if the kids are gene positive, which if I recall in this case they had not been tested, as long as their echoes are normal, generally speaking, that we would clear them. And I think Dr. Kim would agree with this. As long as their echoes are truly normal, uh, and the patients, uh, you know, the 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 young athletes feel fine, asymptomatic then there'd be no reason to exclude them or limit them in any way, uh, just based on a family history or based on an abnormal genetic test, even if they had that, so. Uh, so I, I meant to hit a different button. Jonathan just asked if he missed, he missed the first presentation, is it repeated? This will be on Facebook and on YouTube in a couple of days. So you will get it in both, uh, you can review it anytime you want. Um, I'm sorry, I just, I screwed that one up. So I stopped, jumped on your question. Um, I just want to go back to the, my kid might have HCM question or my kid has mild HCM. What should I do with sports? This is probably one of my most unfavorite topics to discuss because it's just fraught with so many social implications and psychological implications. And it can transcend, you know, generations of the family because we all played softball or we all did this. And why isn't that one doing it? I had a call earlier this week with a mom who's pregnant with her second child and her five-year-old has HCM and he really wants to play sports, but he's already diagnosed and he's starting to define himself by this activity that probably isn't going to be something he can do long-term, but maybe not. So you get into these questions, do I redirect early and give them other options or do I let them go and create a social network that mom and dad then create a social network around and then little sibling follows around and then you you start having this culture in the family that we're the soccer family or we're the lacrosse family and then comes those teenage years where you have to say things have changed you're not the soccer family anymore and everything kind of goes kaplooey if you can make those decisions early in life and think out how you want to deal with them if you have a plan for your escape plan and you've given the child some place else to have an identity that they're not going to be ostracized from community and left out of things, I think that might be a good solution for some people. Um, I think not thinking about it and putting your head in the sand like an ostrich is probably going to come back and bite you in the, well, I'm from New Jersey, guess what I would say next. So Robbie, your thoughts on that? Yeah, you, you, uh, you're right. It's a, it's a, a good question and it's a, frequent topic of discussion with with my patients who you know who all a lot of whom have children who are potentially at risk and what do you do um, do you let them have as normal a childhood as long as they can until such the day comes when potentially they develop the condition and or do you like you said you steer them away and maybe get them into golf or music or you know maybe things that they can they won't have to quit at age 16. Um, it's a tough decision. And it, again, it's a, it ultimately is gonna come down to the parent, you know, it's ultimately gonna be the parent's um, decision. Um, we'll just explain, you know, all we can do is just sort of give them the potential outcomes and roadmaps here. It's like, just, you know, you know, I have a patient 
who's the he's the head soccer coach of one of our local university soccer teams and he was a former professional soccer player until he's diagnosed with hypertrophic cardiomyopathy he has two young boys who surprise are really good at soccer and so we've had this discussion and um you know it's like look you you they you have to be prepared and they sort of have to be prepared too for the fact that at age 16 they may you know you may tap them on the shoulder and say this is it so like you said you as long as they're sort of emotionally prepared and have maybe an exit plan, right? Well, now I can maybe be an assistant coach or a manager, or I don't know, go play golf or, you know, or, or one of those other sports that are, that are better. I think as long as they're prepared and understand it's, it's up to them, but you're right. I've had other families that say, you know what, we're not going to let them play basketball. You know, I, I think we do, we're going to sort of steer them towards this or that. And we're going to sort of discourage soccer and basketball and football and those sort of more intense sports. So it's, it's a, a, it's a no, tough one. The wrong answer, right? Yeah, there, there's there's some places there's just no good answers. We are going to pivot back to genetics for a moment. Um, we have five people in the immediate family with a genetic marker for HCM, and the question is, uh, only the son actually has a clinical presentation. I do not know the age. Is this a good sign for the son's prognosis, or does it matter at all? So five people have a genetic okay. diagnosis, but only one is phenotype positive? That is what the question says. And I do not know where these individuals were screened. I don't know the quality of the echoes or whether they were MRI. So there's a whole bunch of yeah. blind screen. So that's a lot of unknowns in answering that question. But I would say, you, you know, the phenotype of cardiomyopathy is variable within families. So it's hard. So that sounds totally typical and that might be a valid, you know, genetic diagnosis that has future risk for all those, all those relatives. So I would also say that genetic interpretation has changed over time. And we always make a point to reevaluate mutations when patients return to clinic. Um, a lot of mutations have been downgraded. They used to be pathogenic, but with new guidelines and new information on the background, um, prevalence of some of these variants that are now known to be seen frequently in the general population, they've been downgraded to normal. So we do have families that have what they thought was a pathogenic mutation. And now with the current data, it's, it's normal. Now, if you have somebody who truly has HCM, we would recommend retesting that patient with a current era panel with, you know, just as a greater depth and um, validity to it and see, you know, if that's, if that's real. So. I think that's a, a good answer. Can you please define phenotype and genotype again? So the genotype is what the DNA says. And the phenotype is the presentation of the patient. So the HCM is the phenotype. That's the cardiac diagnosis. It's thick. It might have rhythm problems. It might have poor function. That's the phenotype. The genotype is what is your specific DNA mutation. So if somebody carries the gene, but their hearts are still normal, EKG is still normal, there's no disease present in the heart that is visible as of yet. That right, is but phenotype it, positive, phenotype negative. But it's important to remember HCM is not a children, babies can be born with HCM, but typically is not the case. Um, it can onset at any age. So that is why the screening recommendations are at regular intervals throughout lifetime. Okay. So if you're genotype positive, keep your screening up. Absolutely. Okay, I am going to say thank you to those who have been watching on Facebook. We're going to say goodbye to you now. Please come by tomorrow at 11 a.m. and we'll be doing a podcast with uh, Marty Marin and our special guest, Seth, who are going to be discussing exercise and HCM and competitive athletics and ICDs and all kinds of crazy things that might have happened. So it's gonna be a really great story. Come on and visit it. Um, and then also on April 10th, we're having our uh, Let's Get Sauced event. You can see that on the Facebook page. We hope you join us. Bye-bye, Facebook.